one of the best movies of 2023 being Godzilla Minus One told us anything is that Studio Toho still knows how to make a monster movie for the ages being lauded by both foreign and domestic audiences. Godzilla Minus One was the kind of monster movie that doesn't get made anymore, filled with well-rounded, fascinating human characters, a tremendous story about redemption and sacrifice being placed into a bomb-stricken Japan at the end of World War II, with the very common theme of civilizations uniting as one against impossible odds, and a Godzilla portrayed as the most evil, menacing force of destruction and served as the perfect metaphor for nuclear holocaust that we have ever seen in recent memory. For as amazing Minus One is, you still get the bittersweet feeling of, man, if only us Americans made a movie that could stand up to something as good as this. Now, I'm not gonna state like some shoebill stork on the internet that Godzilla cannot work in the United States and be as great as something like Godzilla Minus One. It can happen. Anything is possible. In fact, I still think that Godzilla 2014 is still a pretty good movie. The problem is that Hollywood doesn't have anybody equally talented to make something as good as Minus One or even the old Godzilla films of the past. And I get it, Godzilla Minus One is a much more serious movie compared to the MonsterVerse. In fact, Studio Toho has made Godzilla films that have a similar tone and spirit as the latest MonsterVerse installments like Godzilla vs. Kong. Regardless of whatever tonal or narrative direction the radioactive kaiju goes, the quality and consistency, my viewers, is what truly matters at the end of the day. I've touched on my retrospective of the MonsterVerse in my Godzilla vs. Kong review, so if you want to take a gander at that before you watch the rest of this video, Go right on ahead. Suffice to say, Warner Brothers MonsterVerse has uh, kind of declined in quality after the release of 2014's Godzilla and Kong Skull Island. King of the Monsters left me in a crippling depression after repeated viewings, and Godzilla vs. Kong, while narratively brain dead with its plot holes at every turn, at least manages to somewhat compensate with a spectacular series of face-offs between the two title monsters along with other redeeming technical and entertaining aspects that make it somewhat watchable. Though upon retrospect, it's still a pretty bad movie and even I have to admit I was a little generous with my rating. Now if you're five movies in and a vast average of your movies have either been polarizing or below mediocre, if I were to put it politely, how does one rectify past gripes justified by critics and audiences while giving them both what they want. Do take the monsters in an interesting grounded direction like the TV show Monarch Legacy of Monsters, or if you were to continue the zaniness route of Godzilla vs Kong, you flush out the human characters, modify the script into something cohesive that makes sense with the film's world building, while also giving us epic monster brawls that everyone came to see. With Godzilla x Kong the New Empire, well, it did give us the action scenes. As the fifth film in the franchise, Godzilla x Kong The New Empire, while marginally improved script-wise compared to its progenitor, though that margin is razor thin, still suffers from the same exact problems as its predecessor, and conveys, to an extent, as a warning sign for what's to come of this universe. Oh sure, it'll make millions of dollars at the box office and make its budget back, but much like Michael Bay's Transformers, no matter how much money it makes, the flaws are undeniable. The fifth edition of the MonsterVerse takes place after the events of Godzilla vs Kong. Both Titans, after a showdown in Hong Kong, formed a temporary alliance to defeat and eviscerate Mechagodzilla, who threatened both their lives and territories. Years later, both monsters have separated to take charge of their own realms. Godzilla stays on Earth to destroy all monsters and balance the natural order, while Kong resides in his Jules Verne habitat, the Hollow Earth. Meanwhile, up in the surface, the scientific kaiju research organization Monarch has picked up peculiar patterns from Hollow Earth. With our team of human characters from the last movie to investigate, they soon realized that the patterns were actually a distress call from an uncharted Iwi civilization to let them know that a gigantic, sinister ape named the Scar King, along with his enslaved, ice-breathing kaiju named Shimu, is prophesized to emerge from Hollow Earth and to bring forth a new Ice Age onto the surface. And thus, it is time for Godzilla and Kong, the Titan Tag Team Champions of the World, to eliminate another adversary. Being the generous man I am, 
Let's begin with the good stuff. Anything relating to the monsters and only the monsters is pretty promising. Primarily portions of the movie that have to deal with the character of Kong. Referenced in my Godzilla vs. Kong review, despite him being an ape the size of a skyscraper, the motion capture and effects work for this movie do a very valiant job giving Kong so much character and personality as a charismatic yet level-headed warrior taking control of a subterranean realm. And as far as plot threads go, his entire storyline is perhaps the most investing in the entire movie. With Kong being the last of his kind, he scours across the realm to see if there's anybody else like him. And once he does and brings a young ape named Sucko under his wings, it eventually leads into an interesting direction for the character to take as he tries to find his rightful place in the world. I also have to admire the bond that Kong has with the young ape Suko, being able to teach him the ways of survival and having each other's back when the going gets tough despite scenes prior getting off on the wrong foot. So yeah, anything to do with Kong, easily one of the best parts of the whole movie. On the other corner, Godzilla, for what little screen time he has, again, doesn't have a real objective outside from draining radiation from a nuclear plant in France, killing Scylla and Tiamat, using the Roman Colosseum as a place to nap, which I thought was pretty funny, and isn't relevant to the plot up until the last act of the movie where Kong needs to dap his homie up. Also, Godzilla is pretty athletic for some reason. I know this sounds like a nitpick, but whenever he is running, you don't feel the weight and power of this creature, which is why in past installments, he's very slow, and at his most fast, he lumbers and hobbles towards his enemy. Now he's sprinting like a 20-year-old fangirl towards a Taylor Swift concert, and he has remarkable reflexes even in zero gravity. But enough about Godzilla, let's talk about the main villain of the film, the Scar King. Honestly, there's really not much to talk about. The Scar King is another movie monster for Kong and Godzilla to conquer. He has no bigger ambitions aside from doing evil things just because he's evil. While there is nothing particularly special about the Scar King, I do have to give kudos to where it is due because much like the characterization of King Ghidorah, the filmmakers gave Scar King much more characterization to work with of being an overconfident, zealous warlord rather than having the persona of being just a brooding, dimensionless CGI monster. And speaking of CGI, the visual effects are pretty solid for what they are, although they're not as groundbreaking or immaculate as they once were 10 years ago with the release of the first Godzilla film. And the cinematography looks commendable for the most part, mainly with shots that allow the viewer to witness these titans clash with these wide and epic shots. Otherwise, you would have very distracting, needless radial blur shots that serve no applicable function other than Adam Wingard thought that it looked cool. Must have picked up that idea from Zack Snyder. And now for the subject that got people's butts in their seats to witness, the action scene. With Godzilla vs. Kong, I praise the action for their tremendous back and forth structure, making you feel like that one side could win, and the creative choreography between both monsters, allowing them to utilize their strengths and exploiting their weaknesses. So were the fights in Godzilla x Kong awesome? Yeah, they are. Goofy, extravagant, and full of cheesy and bloody moments to spare, Godzilla x Kong has action sequences for you to witness, and there is a bunch that deliver. From Godzilla smashing Scylla to pieces, to Kong and the Scar King having a World of Warcraft style mock gora, or in English, a fight to the death, to Godzilla and Kong doing their best War Warriors impression and clobbering the Scar King and Shimu to kingdom come. And of course, in a monster movie like this, there's gonna be some collateral damage, buildings falling down and people getting squished. Now I may sound disgusting saying this, I don't mind the devastation in a monster movie. It mainly depends on the kind of movie it is and the context in the story. The problem is that they don't follow up on the devastation. They never touch on the horrific aftermath, how the world governments are going to respond to what was going to be a potential ice age, or how they can prepare themselves better if anything like this ever happens again. Much like how they tried and failed to go further with it in King of the Monsters. And by the time the movie can think of a reason to delve into any of those consequences, 
We cut to credits. Casualties are casualties at the end of the day. No matter how many times Adam Wingard wants to smash his kaiju figurines together, even if the action scenes are pretty awesome. And maybe in the future we might actually get something that combines the over-the-top action sequences with very profound storytelling. But ah, I hear you asking, Luke, it's Godzilla and Kong fighting other monsters. Does anybody go into a Godzilla and Kong movie for the story? I don't care if it's a movie about robotic dinosaurs kickboxing aliens from outer space. The story is the catalyst of how you get to what you paid to see. Besides, if all you want to do is see the climatic action scene, why are you paying eight or $15 per ticket when you can just sneak into the movie theater to the last 10 minutes or just watch the pirated action scenes on YouTube. A movie is more than a gigantic CGI action scene of monsters fighting monsters. For people who actually give a crap about stories and want to improve this franchise, let us continue. The human character's contribution weighs the movie down significantly. Their relevance ruins any kind of cause and effect. A couple of them lack any kind of character development and only exist to serve as convenient plot devices to get from one scene to the next or to help Kong in an action scene. Oh no, Kong is injured and his hand looks really bad. I don't know what we can possibly do. Well, golly gee, lucky for us, there just so happens to be an exoskeleton power glove that conveniently fits on Kong's right hand. And of course, the entire project was scrapped, but lucky for us, we have a prototype. And thankfully, the prototype just so happens to have antidotes to heal his frostbite. And may I also ask this query for you guys? How can you minimize your human cast for the sake of putting more emphasis on the monsters? And you still make them bland. Much like the movie before, Godzilla x Kong cannot, for the life of itself, write well-written human characters. Half of them, which are like two or three, are walking exposition dumps that tell the audience everything that is happening on screen as it's happening. When they aren't spouting information that isn't written with authentic dialogue, they also exist to provide comedic relief in which about 94% don't land. The majority of it comes from Brian Tyree Henry as Bernie Hayes, who was a character from the last movie, who was the former Apex employee and conspiratorial kaiju expert. In his awkward, ear-splitting humor, just isn't funny at all. I also stated that just like the last movie, the best performance from one of the human characters was Kaylee Hoddle as Gia. And she does well here as she did before. The problem with Gia is that the film turns her into a plot device, who for the sake of the plot, turns out to be telepathic and is prophesized to be a prominent figure in resurrecting a famous kaiju for the tribe. The worst part about it is that there was no setup of any kind in GVK and it's all done and executed in a way that feels so convenient for the story. The only actor who is pretty self-aware of what kind of film he's being featured in would have to be Dan Stevens as the Titan veterinarian named Trapper. He's the only one who boasts the most personality and is willing to share chemistry with the rest of the cast. However, at the end of the day, he's still someone who exists to provide exposition and somehow knows how to do anything at any point in time. After watching Godzilla x Kong The New Empire, I have no earthly clue what Warner Brothers is gonna do from here. There is massive potential for this franchise to be better than it is. It has a chance to be more than just a toy commercial. I mean, why else would they make Godzilla pink and give Kong more weapons to use than a battle axe? If this franchise keeps going to be written and directed by subpar filmmakers and screenwriters, then over the coming years, we're gonna continue getting more movies like Godzilla x Kong. Much like Michael Bay's Transformers, and this should be worrisome to you guys who are a fan of this franchise, at a certain point, they're gonna run out of story ideas and audiences are gonna go, yeah, the action looks fine and all, but when are we gonna get a story that is worthwhile? If Warner Brothers are gonna answer those prayers, it's only a matter of time. My name is Luke Newcomb, and you, my friends, have been blown away.